Hello everyone, Phil Yeske, Science and Alliance Officer at UMDF, with you today to advance a discussion around voice of the patient in mitochondrial disease. Uh, just a reminder that back in March of 2019, UMDF co-hosted a patient-focused drug development meeting with the FDA that led to a number of significant learnings about the burden of disease for mitochondrial disease patients, but also what's important to mitochondrial disease patients from a therapeutic development perspective. Uh, one of the most important findings uh, from that patient-focused drug development uh, meeting was the pervasive fatigue as a very common symptom of mitochondrial disease patients. So today I'm joined with uh, by uh, Swedish pharmaceutical company uh, Adleva. I have Magnus Hansen, the chief medical officer with us here today, as well as two representatives from Sprout Health Solutions, uh, Sarah Clifford, who is a partner there, and uh, Roxy uh, Bahar, who is a lead uh, uh, scientist at, at Sprout Health Solutions. Um, and they're gonna talk about a study that they engage with to better understand the role of what I'm describing as pervasive fatigue in mitochondrial disease patients. Uh, we will uh, record this today. Uh, this will be uh, available on our YouTube channel, the UMDF YouTube channel. So if you've uh, enjoyed watching this, please share the, the link uh, with your um, uh, fellow mitochondrial disease patient uh, friends. Uh, Magnus, I'm gonna start with you if it's okay. Uh, just give me a little bit of background on Adleva, first of all, what your goals are as a company, what you're trying to accomplish, and uh, maybe a little bit about the history of the intervention you're developing and, and what you're moving towards with the clinical trial and why this study became so important to you. Thank you, Phil. Yeah, well, Adleva is a biotech company, and our mission is to improve the lives of mitochondrial disease patients. And we do that through the development of new innovative medicine. So our most advanced compound is KL1333. And this has just completed several phase one clinical trials, which is trials in healthy volunteers, but also a small study in mitochondrial disease patients. So we are now about to initiate a larger clinical trial. And there we will evaluate how effective the drug is for the treatment of mitochondrial disease. But as you know, since there are no approved therapies for mito disease, there are no established outcome measures, meaning there's no uh, established recipe for how a mitochondrial disease trial needs to be designed in order to get approval from the regulatory authorities. So this is, of course, both a challenge, but it is also an opportunity. So when evaluating different potential outcome measures, it was really important for us to study the impact we could have on symptoms that really matters most to the patients. So what we have learned from speaking to patients over the last several years, the meeting back in 2019 that you referred to is that fatigue is really important. There are actually a number of existing general fatigue questionnaires for different types of diseases, but there is no specific tool to evaluate fatigue in mitochondrial disease patients. So there's no mito fatigue scale. Mm -hmm. So what we really wanted to do was to create a specific short form with a set of questions that capture what is most important from mitochondrial fatigue. So the fatigue in mitochondrial disease patients. So with that tool, we can then use that in our upcoming uh, trial to really test is scale one triple three effective or not on mito fatigue. Yeah, and I think it's fair to say that the goal would be to develop a, a scale or a set of questions that can be shared with the regulatory agencies to demonstrate mm -hmm. the role of fatigue and that it is a measurable factor, right, in, inside mm -hmm. of mitochondrial disease. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, so um, uh, with, with that background, uh, maybe, uh, Sarah, we can kind of turn to you, uh, talk about how uh, Sprout became involved in this project. 
Yeah, so uh, we became involved when we were uh, introduced to a believer by an old colleague of ours who knew that we had done um, a lot of research on fatigue and chronic illness in the past. Um, so we've done work in understanding fatigue in other chronic illnesses like rheumatoid arthritis, chronic fatigue in cancer. Um, and we've also had a lot of experience in selecting and evaluating fatigue measures. Um, you know, several exist, as Magnus um, mentioned just, just previously. So it seemed a really good fit for us to help a believer with what they were trying to do in terms of understanding fatigue in the PMD patient population and then selecting, you know, developing and, and, and evaluating a new measure that can assess fatigue in this patient population. Yeah, and so fair to say the goal of this research study was really about kind of laying the groundwork through a series of interviews um, mm -hmm. of uh, a better understanding fatigue in mitochondrial disease patients. And, um, you know, Roxy, maybe a good question for you then. Like, so who participated in the study and, and what was involved in the study? How did the patients participate? So we had um, people in the United States uh, with primary mitochondrial disease and who had moderate to severe fatigue. Um, and they participated. We had UMDF helped us get the word out and um, let people know that if they were interested, they could contact us. And so through that process, we ended up with 14 participants um, and they were between the ages of 20 and 75. Um, and what we asked them to do was to have two interviews with us. Each one is about an hour. Um, and they were really like informal conversations, especially the first interview where we, we first wanted to know, okay, what is fatigue like when you have primary mitochondrial disease? How does it show up in your body? What are the different ways that it manifests? How does it impact your life? Um, and what's most important to people with primary mitochondrial disease in terms of their experience, what means the most to them. And after that, we had a second interview um, where we asked them to evaluate these questions that we came up with mm -hmm. for the for the questionnaire. So we wanted their feedback to know that, you know, is this relevant? Does it make sense? Um, is it easy to answer? That kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So um, that's those were the two stages of the interview process. All right. Well, I think you know what's coming next. What what did the <laughs> uh, the primary mm -hmm. mitochondrial disease patients tell you in these interviews? Well, um, I mean, it was really so overwhelming in, in some cases to talk to people about their experience because fatigue was just sort of all encompassing mm -hmm. um, for almost everyone we spoke to. And I mean, there were the things that we sort of expected, like, yes, people feel, feel very tired. They can feel exhausted, um, out of energy, that sort of thing. Um, having some muscle fatigue, specific fatigue in different parts of the body. Um, and then also there was this mental fatigue and memory issues, difficulty focusing, um, difficulty concentrating and sort of retaining and taking in information that came up a lot. Um, and also just kind of moving slowly physically and not being able to keep up with people. Those were kind of the, the sort of physical manifestations. Um, and then just the impacts were so far ranging. Mm -hmm. So people just from a, a level of like getting out of bed in the morning, um, taking a shower, you know, being able to physically wash your hair and, and sort of use those muscles. Yeah. Um, yeah. getting dressed, kind of presenting yourself to the world. That was really difficult for a lot of people. Um, just needing to rest constantly between those activities that I think most people who don't experience this fatigue would think of as you, you just kind of do them. You don't even think about it. Yeah. And it had to be, you know, very structured throughout the day, um, needing to plan the day to manage energy, needing to plan the week and strategize and just the level of sort of mental energy that that in itself takes to to plan out every day and every week like that um and yeah. then things like not being able to work um or having difficulty kind of keeping up at work not being able to take care of children um which was very emotional for the people that told us about this because they felt like you know i'm missing out on my children's lives because i can't take care of them. I can't play with them. I'm just, they say like, you know, oh, mommy's always tired. And, um, you know, that was really sad and, and heartbreaking. Um, 
and difficulty doing chores, just sort of like cleaning your house. And a lot of people felt kind of shame and embarrassment that they couldn't do these things that, you know, our society kind of expects us each to do. And then just leisure, um, you know, things like some people said they couldn't, you know, golf or go to the beach or even like reading, you know, something that we might think of as a low energy activity or a relaxing activity was very difficult um, to focus, to kind of stay mentally engaged. Um, and, you know, relationships with family, relationships with friends. People would say um, to our participants, you know, oh yeah, I'm really tired too. And that felt very hurtful um, and and sort of minimizing. And I think a lot of people felt like they weren't actually seen for what their experience was. Um, so, you know, this could affect their mood, a lot of depression, anxiety, feeling like, well, I can't even participate in life. So what's the point? Um, and a loss of a sense of self like who am i if i can't do these things you know if i can't do all of the things i love or even the things that most people do like what is my identity so it was just so pervasive um and had such huge impacts on our participants lives in in every way yeah i think you know many times it can be misperceived as just being tired like you know any of us even healthy individuals might be tired or say they feel fatigued mm -hmm. but this is something really different and you know what, what you've described it, 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 just recalling so many of the testimonials we we received as part of the patient focused drug development meeting and just a reminder to everyone that all of the materials associated with that patient focused drug development meeting are available on the umdf website there's a full transcript of the meeting there's a voice of the patient report um, for, it's a really wonderful resource for going back and and hearing these stories and so in a study like this, you know, Roxy, it's clear you had a chance to, you know, push a little deeper in understanding these through, through the interviews. And what strikes me is that fatigue leads to many of these symptoms. And there's this feedback loop as well of then, you know, in just carrying out daily activities and things we all take for granted as healthy individuals, you create more fatigue, right? And so there's this... Uh, a spiral of sorts, right, that, that occurs. And, you know, quite often we hear about the, the crash, right, the mito crash, where mm -hmm. they just don't have any energy anymore. It sounds like fatigue is really at the heart of, of much of that. Yeah, absolutely. And in a similar way, a lot of people mentioned that their some of their other symptoms of their mitochondrial disease had this feedback loop with their fatigue. So like, you know, people who had eye issues and issues with vision and, you know, the muscles in their eyes, they found that their fatigue would make that worse and that the the amount of energy they had to expend to use their eyes to see would make their fatigue worse. Right. Um, and same with hearing, like there's yeah. kind of this cyclical mm -hmm. and, and pain. There's sort of everything is kind of reinforcing everything else and it and it becomes very sort of overwhelming um, and difficult to deal with i think for for a lot of people yeah so we're obviously really interesting results and you know sarah maybe you can just uh, briefly share with our audience what you'll do with these data you know, with, with the results from from these interviews yeah, so, so those were the results from the first stage of our interviews, so what we call the concept elicitation stage. Uh, so we uh, we sort of took all the interview transcripts, we coded those, where we basically assign a descriptive word um, to capture really the key themes and the topics that are important um, to the patients in our study. Um, what we did next was take that list of key themes, which was essentially the list, um, the topics that Roxy just described, and then we mapped that to uh, some items, some existing questionnaire items from an item bank um, to make sure we were selecting items for the fatigue questionnaire for a believer's clinical trial that were really grounded in patients' experience um, of PMD-related fatigue. Um, so we developed that, a long list of items, and then we went back to our patients and asked them for their feedback. We asked them, asked them to go through each of the items give us some feedback. Does this make sense? Or what does this mean to you? Um, is there anything missing from this uh, set of questions? Um, I'm, I know perhaps Roxy, do you want to say a little bit about the feedback we got from patients in that stage? 
Yeah. So from that, we went in with 20 questions. And from that process, we ended up finding that there were nine questions that we felt covered the range of all of those fatigue experiences and impacts. And that all of our participants found to be, you know, very clear, very easy to answer, um, very relevant to their experience. And so there was kind of that consensus around these nine questions. And so those nine questions then became the um, fatigue questionnaire that hopefully Oblivo will be able to use in their clinical trials. Oh, very, very good. And so Magnus, maybe that's the, you know, the right place to start to bring this discussion to a, to a conclusion. What next, right? Now we have this research and I do describe it as clinical research. Like so many in our patient community often ask, how can I be involved in, in research or serving the mission of developing treatments and cures? It, certainly uh, enrolling in clinical trials is one way, but these studies are very important because they give us the opportunity to design better, more meaningful clinical trials. Exactly. And that, that was the purpose. So this has been a really valuable study and something that the authorities require us to do. So if we're going to have an outcome measure, we need to show that we have validated it. And we have validated through these two sets of, of interviews that Sarah and Roxy ha have described. So, well, now we have this tool with nine questions that we think really capture mito fatigue really well. So now it's, it's going through some additional review and also translations. So th these are actually established items that have been uh, used in other disease areas, so a, a wide item bank, and they are available in a lot of different languages, but not all. So we are try translating them to the final language because the trial we will initiate will be a multinational trial. So we have this set of, of questions that we have developed with the help of, of the unique experience from mitochondrial disease patients. So the next is, step is of course, to get that into the efficacy trial where patients will have, uh, we taken either the active compound, k one triple three or an inactive uh, placebo uh, tablet. But they will not know, we will not know, and the doctors will not know. So that we really can test, is, is the, the new therapies working for mitochondrial fatigue? Yeah. And this will of course be available for, for, for other uses. So um, this will not be proprietary. It's, it, we're using an item bank, which has been developed by the support of, of NIH. So that's also a benefit of, of this. Yeah, that, that's really wonderful. Right? Mm -hmm. We, we want to use each one of these opportunities as, a, as an opportunity to grow the number of tools that are in the toolbox to be able to uh, objectively measure um, how well our mitochondrial disease patients respond to, to, to various interventions. So you know, you know, thank you for, for, for sharing that. Uh, Magnus, I know that you plan to share back with the community the results of this. It sounds like there's some uh, collateral being pulled together, a nice one-page summary that UMDF can help uh, di distribute. Um, obviously, uh, always available for, for follow-up questions, but um, we thank you for, for this important undertaking and for sharing with us uh, today. So thank you for, the, for, for that, Magnus. And uh, to Sprout, to Sarah and Roxy as well for talking about uh, how you carried out the, the project as well. Uh, so thanks for, for joining today. Um, please stay tuned, uh, audience. Uh, patient voice is a really central component of uh, UMDF's mission uh, going forward, particularly as we move into this clinical era where there's going to be more clinical trials. Um, we need to better understand the patient voice and uh, again, today's study, a really good example of how we can drill down and better understand, in this case, a really important symptom of fatigue. Again, thanks everyone, and we'll look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you, Phil. Thank you. Bye.